what is a tornado? The picture you see there is actually right out here in the Charleston Harbor. It's a picture of a funnel cloud taken from one of the boats as they're going out to Fort Sumter. Now a funnel cloud is a rotation inside a storm or a rain shower that doesn't make it all the way to the ground. A tornado does make it all the way to the ground. So luckily for us in the Carolinas, most of them are fairly small and fairly benign, but in other parts of the country, they can be very deadly. The best way I can describe it is that if you have a thunderstorm and you have winds coming in at different directions and at different wind speeds, it starts to, it starts to possibly rotate that storm. The whole storm will start to spin, almost like a top. And it's sometimes when those storms start to spin that it can produce a tornado. Not all of them do it. And that's the part of the science that's very complicated and very frustrating for us meteorologists is why do some storms produce tornadoes and why some don't. And unfortunately, that's part of the science that is going to keep evolving. And hopefully in the near future, in the next several years, we'll be able to see more tornadoes and be able to forecast them a little bit better. But right now, it's, it's, it's fairly tough to do. So how do they form? Well, like I said, there's a thing called wind shear. Now, wind shear is a fancy word for saying that winds are coming in at different directions, at different heights of, of, the, uh, of the air or of the, of the atmosphere. Uh, a lot of planes don't like to fly through wind shear because the, the, the plane ride is very bumpy at that point. What that does, though, it allows the thunderstorms to become very strong and then possibly spin. And so this column of air starts to actually spin and it actually gets pushed upward into a vertical. And a lot of times that's in the beginning seed of a thunderstorm, of a, of a tornado, excuse me. Now where most of them occur, has anybody ever heard of Tornado Alley before? Now we're not in Tornado Alley. Tornado Alley, as you can see by the graphic, is kind of in the middle part of the country. Pretty much stretches from uh, northern Texas going all the way up to the into parts of uh, South and North Dakota. That's where the big tornadoes happen and that's where they happen most often. That's not to say we don't have tornadoes here. We do, very often we do, but they do tend to be smaller and a lot of ours actually happen during hurricanes. So well, some parts of the country have a tornado season like in the springtime when the, when the, have you ever heard that, uh, the statement, you know, the spring comes in like a lion or something, There's a lot of strong thunderstorms. Uh, we can actually get them year round here in the Carolinas. So it's, uh, it's something we always have to look out for. This is kind of a map that kind of shows across the country where most of them do happen. And again, in the middle part of the United States is what we call Tornado Alley. Now in the western United States, they hardly happen at all. Okay, do very infrequently. But in the East Coast, and especially down in Florida, they have a lot of uh, minor ones or very weak ones like that. But definitely uh, anywhere pretty much east of the Rocky Mountains, they, uh, they have uh, uh, actually tornadoes. This is actually a, a nice little uh, video actually taken by Doug Barry, who was standing right next to me. Uh, he was out, uh, he's a storm chaser, or he used to be when he used to go to school and be in the center part of the United States. And so this is actually video of uh, him uh, driving his car and actually a lot of the students there taking pictures of this tornado. For all of us meteorologists, this is always what we wanted to do since we were small little kids. And so we like to go out there and see what we're studying, much like a doctor or some of the other type scientists. Well, it's tough for us to see a tornado on a given day, and so sometimes we have to go find them ourselves. And so that's what storm chasers do. Uh, we always have to keep a lot of good distance, obviously because they're very dangerous, and we hope they never hurt anybody. The best ones to look at are the ones opening in the middle of a, of a field that aren't really hurting anybody, and uh, we like to see those type of tornadoes. Now, as a meteorologist or as a weather person at our office, this is kind of what we look at. We look at these funny colors on a screen. Sometimes this is what you see actually on television, too. You see the storm as it is um, talking about how heavy a rain it is. Well, what we do is we look at this, but then we also look inside the storm. And these colors, the red and the blue, I mean, sorry, the red and the greens next to each other indicate that the storm is actually spinning. That is what could become a tornado. Okay, so when we're looking at the and in our office and looking at the radar screen, we're actually looking for places where the spin, where the spin is already occurring. Again, like the like I said earlier, the difficult part is not every time. It doesn't always produce a tornado. It just starts spinning. The storm is spinning. So it's that it's our it's our challenge then to to, to find out which storms are going to produce a tornado then to possibly cause damage. And that's where our science is still very young. There are different categories, like what we talked with hurricanes that have the Saffir Simpson scale. There are different categories of tornadoes too. And a very famous meteorologist named Dr. Ted Fujita, who studied at the University of Chicago, has a category, or had a category of uh, tornadoes. And there's different intensities. A lot of times we always say that, well, the, the bigger the tornado, the stronger the winds, and that's not necessarily always the case. It takes a trained meteorologist to go out and look at the damage before we actually determine how strong a tornado actually was. Now, most of them that we get here 
uh, in this part of the country, we have fairly weak tornadoes. Wind speeds are very small, usually upwards of 100 miles per hour. They can do damage, and they actually cause very few deaths. And they're kind of long and skinny. Uh, they usually look fairly weak as well. And this is kind of some of the damage that occurs. But look at the one picture way up on the top left. That's a piece of twig that's stuck in the side of a house. That tells you that even with a 100 mile per hour wind, you can take a piece of stick or a piece of twig or a branch and actually skewer it through a wall or even maybe even a person. That's why especially we say get inside during all severe weather because the danger is there with all those uh, winds uh, spinning all that debris in all different directions. Strong tornadoes, the next category are what they call F2 and F3 on the Fujita scale. And those are winds much stronger, upwards of category five hurricane force. Now these can be on the ground many, many miles and they can also cause many more deaths. 11% uh, of all the tornadoes are actually uh, in this sort of category. And this is the type of damage. This is actually the shell of a mobile home that was actually picked up and slammed against a telephone pole and was actually wrapped around like that. So it's a, even that strong of wind can, uh, can topple a, a mobile home and actually do quite a bit of damage. Now luckily for us in this part of the country, in the Carolinas or on the East Coast, we don't get a whole lot of the violent tornadoes. These are unfortunately the tornadoes that cause a lot of the deaths in Oklahoma and Kansas and the middle part of the United States. They account for 70% of all the deaths with tornadoes, but 1% of all the tornadoes. So they happen very infrequently, but when they do, unfortunately, they have a lot of deaths with them. Uh, these tornadoes can be on the ground for upwards of 70 miles. That's across an entire city, let's say, much like they had back in 1999, I believe it was, in, in Oklahoma City. Um, and so with wind speeds of well over 200 miles per hour, so you can see the kind of devastation. It'd be like having a very small scale hurricane come through and just wipe out a portion of a town. Here's some damage that you can see from some of these strongest tornadoes. They're, they're quite amazing that they can actually wipe out an entire house or building, that all you get is actually just the concrete. They can actually then strip the, the asphalt off a road. And uh, it's a very impressive picture down there at the bottom of a car that's actually wrapped around a tree. You can see the force of the wind as it actually takes a, an SUV or a truck and can actually wrap it around the, the trunk of a tree. This is some of the, the best video that, I, uh, that I've ever seen. This is actually a helicopter flying around a tornado uh, up there in Minnesota years and years ago. Hopefully the helicopter was pretty far away and this is just a zoom lens because <laughs> I would not want to be in this uh, helicopter flying around. But um, notice in the middle, you can actually see the trees that are actually being uprooted and tossed out almost like weeds. That tells you the suction force that actually a tornado has. And you can see also with the video how the trees actually bend in toward the center of the tornado. When we go out and determine if there was a tornado that happened, we look for the pattern of the trees and how they fell. And that will determine whether or not it was just a strong wind or actually a tornado. So hopefully most of your schools are actually doing tornado drills. I know I did when I was going to school. And so the, the picture on the right is actually uh, of what you may be asked to do. Actually probably go out in the hallway and crouch down and cover your neck. Uh, that's to protect your head and your spinal cord. The reason why you get out of your classrooms is probably because most of your classrooms have a lot of windows. And what you don't want to be is in a room with a lot of windows because when the debris comes in, it'll actually shatter and actually then throw glass everywhere. So you want to be in a place where there's the least amount of actually uh, uh, windows. And uh, another question, how do meteorologists determine when and where a tornado is coming. Well, a lot of that has to do with us tracking the actual storm that the tornado is in. And so if we can track where that storm is going, which we have radar and we've got satellite and we have some other type of uh, um, tools that we can use, that's normally how we can tell where a tornado is, is going to be. And a question from Pennsylvania, how far can a tornado carry you? Let me tell you a little story is that when I was going to school in Oklahoma, uh, we had some students that were doing research of how far debris was getting sent by a tornado. Now, it's not a person, but they found papers like, you know, uh, canceled checks and other pieces of paper from homes hundreds of miles away, hundreds of miles away because it got sucked up in the tornado and it actually then got carried with the storm into another state. Now, a person is much heavier, but I know they have found freight cars and automobiles up to a quarter of a mile or a half a mile away. So it's not unheard of that if you do get caught up in a tornado, you could be found not too close to your house. Like you could Dorothy be Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> exactly. Dorothy in Wizard of Oz, a very good example, yes. So it's nothing you want to hopefully experience, but definitely the, the tornadoes have that much power with it that you can actually get carried away, uh, even miles away most likely. So.